Yeah. <laughs> 
Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to worship on this uh, festival of Thanksgiving. And tonight you have a special order of service before you. It's uh, printed entirely in the service folder. And we'll begin with the opening sentences from Psalm 105. Please rise. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Sing to him, sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done. His miracles and the judgments he pronounced. O descendants of Abraham, his servant. O sons of Jacob. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say this. Those he redeemed from the hand of the Lord. Those he gathered from the lands. From the east the north and south.
Thanksgiving litany will uh, proceed then with several uh, sentences followed by uh, a selection of a hymn. We begin. We give you our thanks and praise, O gracious God, that you have led us to know ourselves for what we really are. And therefore we say, be merciful to me, a sinner. our thanks and praise, O oh gracious God, for the gift of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself into death, that we might have life with you forever. Thanks and praise, O oh gracious Lord, for the gift of your word, in which we have found peace, comfort, conviction, assurance, and hope. thanks and praise of gracious God for the priceless gift of faith by which we have been made your children and heirs of your kingdom.
give you our thanks and praise, O gracious Lord, for the gift of life and health, the abundance of our earthly blessings. our thanks and praise, O oh, gracious God, for the richness and healing of your comfort when our hearts are heavy and the cross overwhelms us. Praise, O oh, gracious God, for the victory you have given our fellow pilgrims and our own loved ones who now live with you in glory.
praise, O gracious God, for the growth of your kingdom in all the earth, to the glory of your name and the salvation of precious souls. Countless other blessings to body and soul which are new to us every morning. We unite our hearts and voices in songs of praise and thanks. this evening as uh, our Thanksgiving meditation from Deuteronomy chapter 8, reading there verses 1 to 10, the text there in your service folder. Moses writes, be conscientious about carrying out the entire body of commands that I am giving you today so that you may thrive and increase, and you may go in and possess the land that the Lord promised by oath to give to your fathers. Remember the whole journey on which the Lord your God led you these 40 years in the wilderness in order to humble you and to test you in order to show, to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commandments. So he humbled you and allowed you to be hungry and he fed you manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known before. In order to teach you that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. The clothes you wore did not wear out. Your feet did not swell these 40 years. So know in your heart that just as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Therefore you are to keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and by revering him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of gullies filled with water, a land with springs and groundwater that flows out into the valleys and down the mountains, a land with wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees for oil and honey, a land where you can eat bread and not be poor, where you will not lack anything, a land whose rocks are iron and from whose mountains you can mine copper. <coughs> then you will eat and you will be filled 
and you will praise the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. This is our text. Dear fellow believers, oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. And we, we pray this with nearly every meal that we take. These words have been used since the time of David to remember the blessings of our Lord. Now, history doesn't tell us this, but maybe these words might have been used at the first Thanksgiving meal of 1621 when the pilgrims and the Indians gathered together to share the blessings of a bountiful harvest. Luther taught it to his uh, people, taught them this passage in 1529 when he was preparing his small catechism, a book we still use today. Some look more than others. And we might assume our ancestors used these words to thank God during the Entedankfest, or the Harvest Home Festivals of a century or more ago. They were common. Now I use these words today as our theme, because I expect that maybe they're going to be repeated in your homes tomorrow, when you celebrate a Thanksgiving meal with you and your loved ones. And as you pray those words, I hope you'll remember the words of this text this evening. The words that Moses spoke to the children of, uh, of Israel just as they were about to take possession of the land that God promised them. Give thanks unto the Lord for the trials which he strengthens us and for the blessings that he provides to us. It's true, isn't it, that God strengthens us through tough times? Luther once wrote, we never know our own hearts which are ever open to God, more certainly than when we are tempted in poverty or other sorrows. God says it in verse 5 of our text. He meant to know what was in the hearts of his Israelites. We know that God was preparing the people, uh, and during those 40 years of wandering, wandering, that wasn't just wasted time. For the Father. He knew, and so do we, what he was preparing them for. Of course, we have the luxury of a 30,000-foot view. It wasn't just the new neighborhood they were moving into. God was preparing them for a whole lot more. This was the nation through which the Savior was coming. These people, so used to being slaves after 400 years of it, needed to see themselves as something else, needed to see themselves as God's chosen people, that they might stand apart from the other nations, because they were now a special people. Moses writes, so know in your heart that just as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. God's discipline might have seemed harsh at the time. Forty years wandering in the desert. But it had a higher purpose. It wasn't easy for the Israelites. And it isn't easy for us either, is it? It's not easy for us when we uh, succumb to God's discipline. We don't have the 30,000 foot view either. We don't know what we're in the midst of sometimes. This is how God trains us. In Proverbs chapter 22, it's a verse we know often. We take comfort in it as parents, but apply it to yourselves, dear children. Train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. Look how God applied that wisdom to the children of Israel. Nahum wrote about Nineveh. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm. The clouds are the dust of his feet. 
His way is in the whirlwind and the storm. For the Ninevites, that was going to mean their destruction. Because they were a wicked people. For the Israelites, it meant that God was going to make use of whirlwinds and storms. Not just the storms that blew around them in the desert. There were some of those, no doubt. But the ones that dotted the landscapes of their lives. There were very real physical hardships. They got hungry and they got thirsty as they traveled through the desert wilderness. Remember when they were at Meribah and they cried out for water. Remember when they ran out of bread, they begged for bread. And when there, um, and when there wasn't enough bread, they wanted meat. Well, God sent them manna and later God sent them quail. God used these little whirlwinds and storms to train his people that they should trust him. And we're just like them. We say, God, if you'd, oh, if you'd only get this monkey off my back, I'll be so grateful and I'll be so much better able to be the servant that you want me to be, that you've always wanted me to be. you just got to. But God knows the master plan. He knows what we don't know, what we can't know. Just as those Israelites couldn't know all of the things that God was preparing them for. If you're in the midst of a storm right now, there's just one thing that you need to know. Your God loves you, and he wants you to trust him. He has not forsaken you. Our text tells us, reminds us really, that it is um, through storms that God humbles us. It was humbling to the Israelites that they weren't able to take care of themselves. They couldn't even provide for themselves the most basic of needs, like some bread to eat. God provided manna because there wasn't anything else to eat. Moses wrote, it was something that you nor your fathers had ever seen. No one ever could have predicted that that would fall from the sky. They were humble because they didn't have the means to put clothing on their backs. But Moses says your clothes didn't wear out. You didn't wear the latest fashions every year. You even knew what they were. But your clothes didn't wear out. And um, something else, your feet didn't swell. You walked all day long. Your feet didn't swell. In 40 years, they didn't swell. The Israelites were humbled through the storms. What about you and me? Where do you end up after a setback? Too many bills, not enough cash, your career off track, your health not doing so well, is your heart sinking? James wrote, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. As a father leads his child, God led the Israelites um, by the hand for 40 years, and they learned to depend on his grace. God kept showing them that he would continue to provide for their bodily needs, whatever they happened to be. They recognized they, uh, that if it weren't for his hand in their lives, their lives would have ended long ago. They would not have survived as a nation if it had not been for God and what he gave them. And they knew that their lives were in God's hands. But God wanted them to depend on him for much more than just their bodily needs. Their spiritual lives were in his hands too. And the Israelites learned to depend on his grace there as well. Moses writes, be conscientious about carrying out the entire body of commands that I am giving you today so that you may thrive and rescue, uh, uh, thrive and increase, and you may go in and possess the land that the Lord promised by oath to give to your fathers. 
God wanted them to obey all his commands. All of them. He wanted them to confess their sins. He wanted them to make atonement for their sins. He wanted them to know that they were forgiven for their sins. He wanted them to remember his promise, not just to inherit the land that they were about to take possession of, but the promise that was part of the fabric that made them Jewish. The promise that was through Adam and Noah and Abraham and Israel, the promise of a savior from sin, and that promise had been made known to no other people like it had been made known to the Israelites. It was for all people. But they were the caretakers of that promise. To them, the promise had to be something much more. It is the same promise that we have today, fulfilled for us in the person of Jesus Christ. The Israelites learned to depend on God's grace for their spiritual needs too. And so David wrote, O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, his mercy endures forever. As they gave thanks for the trials that made them stronger, they also gave thanks for the blessings, and so do, so do we. Look at what they were about to receive. Verses 7 to 9, For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of gullies filled with water, a land with springs and groundwater that flows out into the valleys and down the mountains, a land with wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees, oil and honey, a land where you can eat bread and not be poor, where you will not lack anything, a land whose rocks are iron and from whose mountains you can mine copper. Well watered, what a blessing after 40 years of the desert. Good farmland, big difference from where they have been tromping around. Unproductive desert soil, right? Mineral rich land, which would provide everything that they would need for all of life's daily needs. Everything they could want and more. You drawing any comparisons here? We live in a good land. We do. I'll give you an example of what I mean. There's a friend of mine who's a missionary in Africa, and they come home periodically on furlough. And I remember the first time they came home, and, and my, my missionary friend told this story about his wife going to the grocery store, and she got inside the doors. First of all, when you go to the grocery store in Africa, it's a little different from going to Walmart or Myers. Uh, they might have one of something, and they might not. They don't have aisles, uh, of, like a cereal aisle, with 45 choices. They just don't. So um, when this wife came back, went to the grocery store, she got inside and went looking for what she needed, and she came home with nothing. And she was frustrated, and she told her husband, I was just overwhelmed by the choices. I couldn't buy anything. We're so blessed in this good land that we take for granted just how blessed we are. We're more likely to go to the grocery store and come home with nothing saying, I couldn't find what I wanted. And yet we never get overwhelmed by all those blessings. Sometimes we come home just the opposite. Verse 10 says, Then you will eat, and you will be filled, and you will praise the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. It's always remembered to thank God for the good land in which we live. But don't just give thanks for what's at the grocery store or in your garage. Thank God for the spiritual blessings, too. And I know I'm preaching to the choir tonight. You, that's you, you're the choir right now, right here, in this building. If we lived in Africa in a thatch hut, if we had no money and no food but just the gospel to chew on, we would be full and blessed with everything that we need for this life and for the next. The Israelites knew this. 
And even though they knew this, Moses still needed to say to them, Keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and revering him. Because as they entered that promised land, things were going to be different. They weren't going to be protected by God uh, in the same way. In other words, a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. There were going to be others in the new land. There were going to be temptations. People would be living around them and sometimes even among them. There would be temptations to intermarry with them, to join them in the idolatry that they had to false gods, to participate in their lifestyles, heathen lifestyles. And so Moses reminds them, keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways, by revering him. It was full steam ahead for God's faithful nation. They were headed for the promised land. They were about to receive their inheritance. We have the promise of eternal life because of the incredible sacrifice of God's very own Son on the cross of Calvary. His death for our lives, his righteousness for our shame, his gift of grace through faith freely given, and our eternal reward, heaven everlasting. We give thanks unto the Lord for he is good, for being so uh, richly blessed. I want to read to you a, a Puritan prayer. It's very old. Maybe it was something like the one they offered up when they broke bread with the Indians in 1621. It goes like this. O Lord, I am a shell full of dust, but animated with an invisible, rational soul, and made anew by an unseen power of grace. Yet I am no rare object of valuable price, but one that has nothing and is nothing. Although chosen of thee from eternity, given to Christ and born again, I am deeply convinced of the evil and misery of the sinful state, of the vanity of creatures, but also of the sufficiency of Christ. When thou wouldst guide me, I control myself. When thou wouldst be sovereign, I rule myself. When thou wouldst take care of me, I suffice myself. When I should depend on thy providing, I supply myself. When I should submit to thy providence, I follow my will. When I should study, love, honor, trust thee, I serve myself. I fault and correct thy laws to suit myself. Instead of thee, I look to man's approbation, and am by nature an idolater. Lord, it is my chief design to bring my heart back to thee. Convince me that I cannot by my own God, uh, be my own God, make myself happy, nor my own Christ to restore my joy, nor my own spirit to teach, guide, and rule me, then take me to the cross and leave me there. As you sit down to your Thanksgiving meal tomorrow, I know you won't forget to return and to give thanks for the meal and for every other blessing that you have received this year. Remember to Moses and the Israelites in this text. And give thanks unto the Lord for the trials by which he strengthens us and for the blessings that he provides for us. Amen. <clears throat> May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. We ask our ushers to come forward as we gather our gifts to the Lord's work.
continue as we sing our hymn, we praise you, O God, our Redeemer. great and small, beautiful and awesome, for seen and unseen splendors. We thank you, O oh God. For human life, for talking and moving and thinking together, for common hopes and hardships shared from birth until our dying. We thank you, O oh God. For work to do and strength to work, for the comradeship of labor, for exchanges of good humor and encouragement. We thank you, O oh God. For, for marriage, for the mystery and joy of flesh made one, for mutual forgiveness and burdens shared, for secrets kept in love. We thank you, O oh God. For family, for living together and eating together, for family amusements and family pleasures. We thank you, O oh God. For children, for their energy and curiosity, for their brave play and startling frankness, for their sudden sympathies. We thank you, O oh God. For the young, for their high hopes, for their candid criticism, for their search for freedom. We thank you, O oh God. For growing up and growing old, for wisdom deepened by experience, for rest and leisure, for time made precious by its passing. We thank you, O oh God. For your help in times of doubt and sorrow, for healing our diseases, for preserving us in temptation and danger. We thank you, O oh God. For the church into which you've been called, we have been called. For the good news we receive by word and sacrament, for our life together in the Lord. We praise you, O oh God. For your Holy Spirit who guides our steps and brings us gifts of faith and love. Who uh, prays in us and prompts our grateful worship. We praise you, O oh God. Above all, O oh God, for your Son, Jesus Christ, who lived and died and lived again for our salvation, for our hope in him, and for the joy of serving him. We thank and praise you, eternal God, for all your goodness to us. Give thanks to the Lord who is good. God's love is everlasting. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For I am the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive now with believing hearts the benediction of your God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. <laughs> for our final hymn. Thanksgiving tomorrow to all of you uh, and your families. And um, uh, you'll see in the bulletin Friday, December 2nd. It's wrong in the calendar. It says Saturday. That should be Friday. But Friday, December 2nd, we'll have soup and supper, and then we're going to decorate the church. Um, just if you're wondering, we're going to get the tree the two days before, I think. Well, one day before. Thursday or Wednesday, I think. Uh, and then. Um, we have a Christmas open house, my wife and I, that we host on December 10th. That's a ways off yet. If you'd like to come to that, even if you're from Remus, um, <laughs> we would love to have you. <laughs> Bring something to pass. Uh, and then, uh, by the way, we live back here. Uh, Christmas outreach of Isabella County. There's a place on the table. If you'd like to get something to them without driving into town, you can bring it here. And uh, many people, uh, benefit from that in the community and it all goes locally and um, it's a it's a great help and I think that's it. Is there anything else? Yes? Oh we have refreshments. I don't think you have to pray for cookies. So, um, enjoy the fellowship uh, for a few minutes with us if you have time and uh, the roads are good yet tonight I've heard so Good to have all of you here. God bless. Mm -hmm. 